Uh, as you said, thank you for making it to the last session of the last day. I really appreciate that. Um, uh, so yeah, my name is Rup Ganguly. I'm Chief Solution Architect at Bigstream uh, Solutions, and I'm going to be talking about beyond cluster scaling above linear uh, scaling performance in your cluster. Just a quick word about Bigstream. Uh, what we have is an acceleration product that's uh, software-based and also hardware-based, so it's got a dual, dual nature. Um, and it uh, gives, with zero code change, it allows you to accelerate uh, your big data applications. Our first technical target is Spark. So that's why we're here. So what are we all facing in uh, the big data, big data space is a uh, performance issue. Uh, CPUs are not getting fast, faster as fast as they used to. Uh, there's limitations to Moore's Law coming about. In fact, I think the, the bigger concern is Denard scaling is actually slowing down, so the frequency uh, is not increasing uh, yearly as, as, it, as it used to. So applications like these, uh, whose data needs continue to grow, are getting bottlenecked. And um, you know, in it, it, there's different aspects to um, the lack of performance. It can be networking, as we saw in a previous talk. It can also be compute. It can be I/O. So uh, <clears throat> these these kind of applications are are, are suffering uh, from performance needs. So I, I drew this uh, metaphoric uh, performance wall that these applications are heading towards. So this is, on, this is my one cool animation. So what people are doing to break through that performance wall to recoup some of that performance is acceleration. So as uh, we've seen, and many of you know, uh, the cloud, the big cloud um, providers like Azure and Amazon are putting FPGA into, this, into their cloud. Google has a uh, TensorFlow specific piece of uh, ASIC hardware called the TPU that's aimed directly at that library. And then the vendors are following suit supporting that activity. But really the way I think about it is people are doing application specific or domain specific programming of hardware to get back some of the performance um, that might be lost. And so that's why sessions like this um, are very important. So just uh, in our research and our uh, uh, proof of concepts, we've uh, identified a number of value propositions to acceleration. When I talk about acceleration here, I mean network, compute, and I.O., all of them uh, sort of together. So the first one's pretty clear. It's faster intelligence, faster time to insight. Your batch analytics run faster instead of six hours, takes two hours or one hour. Um, and so that's uh, faster time to insight. The other argument is uh, maximizing uh, return on investment for your infrastructure. That's primarily a cloud argument because you can scale your clusters down or your clusters stay up for less amount of time if they're accelerated. Uh, on premise, what we're finding with our POCs is uh, people want to do more with their existing infrastructure. So that's that argument. Uh, an interesting one is uh, simplifying scalability. So a couple of our customers have data centers in the middle of Manhattan. I don't know if you know what rental prices in Manhattan, but you know, it's very hard to expand that real estate, hard to get more power into these data centers. So acceleration is the way they're looking to uh, increase their performance and get a competitive edge. And then as a former data scientist, this one's kind of dear to my heart, it's a productivity argument, a really a programming argument. So when, when I used to uh, develop my analytics, I did it interactively and usually on a toy piece of data. And then when you go to production, your, your analytic blows up because you're, not, you're missing corner cases or uh, just from probabilistic. So acceleration allows you to develop interactively on a larger uh, piece, piece of data. So that's acceleration. But uh, I want to take a step back and think about why the hell would we do that? Um, why don't we just scale our clusters and get the performance that way? It's fine, CPUs are not getting as fast as they used to, but we can scale our clusters, right? When we talk about scaling. Um, there's two types that I think about scale up, which is increasing the capability of your, your given set of nodes. So usually that is an increase in the core count of your nodes, but it can be other resources too, like increased memory, um, things like that. And then scale out is increasing the number of nodes, not necessarily the uh, not necessarily capability, keeping the type, types fixed, but buying more computers. So this is really throwing hardware at the problem. Um, and of course, there's hybrids of this. You can scale up and scale out at the same time. I'm just treating them as two different uh, axes right now. But there's issues with both of them, as we all know. And I'm not here to teach uh, parallelism 101. But uh, with scale up, uh, there's increased IO overhead incurred by the, the uh, uh, cores. A lot of the storage um, 
technologies have a per instance uh, throttling for I.O. So you can run into that problem. There's a lot of shared resources on your, on your box that the cores are going to be fighting over, L2 cache, memory, and uh, the scheduling complexity of the processes on a given uh, instance increase with scale up. Scale out has similar problems. You're increasing the network overhead that you're incurring by having more instances, more network interfaces. Uh, straggler effects can be exacerbated because uh, you're, you're basically your computation getting spread out over more computers. So if you have a straggler, it really stands out and limits your performance even more as you scale out. And also the failure rate can increase, and that's related to you know, taking care of the cluster, uh, DevOps kind of things. Um, so these all these have issues. Scaling has issues, and generally we see sublinear performance with scaling, right? So you increase the number of computers by n, you're not going to get n times more performance. We all pretty much know that. Um, so what we did was just a very simple uh, analysis, a very simple experiment. Um, this is a couple of uh, TPC DS benchmarks. These are business intelligence benchmarks that we ran, and this is scale up. Uh, scale out has sort of a similar. Uh, similar uh, picture as well. So what we see here is the blue line is ideal speed up. So as we go along the x-axis, we're doubling the size of our computers. There's always four nodes, but we're increasing the number of virtual CPUs per computer. So uh, the, the, the uh, x points are 16, 32, 64, 128, and 256 virtual CPUs. So we have uh, in a four node cluster. And uh, you can see that we get uh, scaling performance that's below uh, that's below ideal, right? And it really starts to fall off as you, as you scale to the highest in this particular domain. And I'm not going to go into the details of why that's happening. Some of the issues I outlined on the previous slide are probably taking, taking place. Uh, this is really an Ill illustrative an example. So now let's add in acceleration. So a couple things to notice here. Um, this is uh, accelerated Spark using, uh, and this is the software-based uh, acceleration. So we're not doing any FPGAs yet. Um, so this is just uh, basically native C++ uh, Spark tasks uh, that are automatically compiled for the CPU, and they obviously run a lot faster. So the things to notice is that, you know, in the baseline, at the, at the baseline configuration, you get about a 2x speed up, and then the rest of the speed up numbers are actually above the linear line uh, when compared to that, to that baseline uh, Spark. And uh, now the same effects are happening as we scale. So it's not going to remain super linear the whole time. But in this particular domain, it does remain above the linear line. The other thing to notice is there's, uh, remember that TCO argument, total cost of operation argument. What we've done, if you look at, for example, if you look at the 64 and 128 numbers, so if you look at the accelerated 64 vCPU number, it's a little bit higher than the unaccelerated 128 vCPU number, right? So what we've done there is for a cheaper cluster, we're getting sort of the same performance. And so that's the kind of thing that you can think about acceleration uh, buying for you. <clears throat> so why don't we all just do this? I mean, why don't we just accelerate and everybody be happy? Um, there's an inhibitor. And the way we think about it at Bigstream is it's a programming model gap. So data scientists, developers, quants, that's what I used to be about a year ago, uh, we like to think about our ap applications in a very domain-specific way, right? We have a FinTech algorithm, we've got an AdTech algorithm something we're coding in a high-level language generally on one of these big data platforms. We don't want to think about, and in my case, can't even, couldn't even uh, program an FPGA or, or a GPU, right? The, the gentleman earlier referenced how complex the programming of that, um, th that hardware is. Um, a lot of the larger organizations that we see ha might have a performance engineering team. Now, those folks know very well how to program that hardware, but they have the opposite problem. Well, they don't want to think about the application application layer. They don't want to think about financial uh, pricing models or anything like that. So what we see in these organizations is this programming model gap. Really, it's a skills gap where these two groups have to work together, and that causes a lot of complexity and can actually slow your time to insight. So that's, that's the problem we've got to solve with acceleration. So what we've come up with is the Bigstream hyper acceleration layer. And at a high level, what you want to think about is it automates the process of acceleration. Okay. So the key intuition in this picture is that all of those big data platforms in the white box, at the end of the day, what they produce is what I'm going to call a data flow. And let me define that. It's your data and then a set of transformations to that data, including concurrency information, result production and consumption. It's a DAG, 
directed acyclic graph. All of these big data platforms at the end of the day produce one. They look different from platform to platform, but they do produce, produce that. That's how they express uh, the parallel computation. So what we've developed at the top of that blue box is the data flow adaptation layer, which adapts these different DAGs, these different data flows, to what I'm going to say in air quotes is a canonical big stream data flow, whose operations, whose stages have been pre-accelerated or pre-compiled for the hardware you see there. So that's how we can talk about sort of 2x to 30x acceleration, depending on your hardware mix and depending on your application characteristics. But the key thing, the real differentiator in, in some of the other acceleration technologies is zero code change. So we deal with the DAG. We compile the DAG. We can't touch the application even if we wanted to. There's, zero, there's no code change. There's no library calls. There's no compiler pragmas or anything like that. Uh, so I've told you a pretty simple story about the architecture. Um, there's a lot that goes into making this cross-platform, uh, cross-acceleration hardware. We have algorithms to slice and dice your computation across a heterogeneous environment that we've enabled now. Um, the other comment I'd make is that this is really, uh, you want to think about this as a framework. So what we're doing here is we're taking application-level semantics that's been expressed by the programmer and bringing them down to hardware automatically. So I've, I've told a very um, a data analytics-centric story that can apply also to storage, uh, intelligent storage, intelligent networking cards, anything where the application-level semantics can help with performance at the hardware level. So that's what this framework enables, and we're actually working with some of these technology companies to, to, to make use of this. So we have an exciting announcement that uh, we are accelerating uh, Spark on AWS uh, F1 instances. We just saw uh, Azure um, acceleration hardware. This is on uh, um, AWS Amazon. Um, and so what we've done is we've accel hyper accelerated Spark on an F1 instance. Uh, and you just allocate your instance with the standard GUI. And I'll demonstrate that. Uh, it was pretty exciting for me. Has anybody here allocated an F instance and used it? Show of hands. One person, okay. I feel pretty proud. Um, so, and the result here, uh, this is again the TPC DS benchmark suite. We're getting about, on average, 3.3 end-to-end uh, speed up. And again, end-to-end -end is the key there. It's, it includes ingest, compute, all that. Um, and the other interesting thing, for technical reasons that are sort of beyond me, um, we're only able to use right now 45% of the FPGA footprint. So we expect these numbers to go up. As we're, able, as we're enabled to, to use more of the footprint. I have my FPGA expert in the crowd here if people have questions about that. Um, and so these results are also applicable to on-premise. So what you want to think about is that for a fraction of the cost of your server, you're getting this kind of acceleration uh, by adding an FPGA card, and again, with zero code change. Okay? So now we're going to do a demo. This is going to be live, so I'm a little, forgive me if I'm a little nervous. <laughs> Okay, so, so what we have here is, um, this is our standard uh, AWS EC2 GUI, and uh, all you have to do to get your F instance is just hit launch instance. Um, you gotta select an a AMI, so that's a machine image. So this is our big stream AMI. Um, comp2, I think, sorry. So it just so happens that um, this is the AMI to enable big stream. And then you just go down here. And voila. Let's click on that. This is, and then, just, and, and then just launch it. OK. Now the problem is, is if I didn't have big stream, I would have no idea how to program that thing. But now that I have it, um, what I've done is, as you can see, I've allocated um, two for the demo. And these are just clones of each other. So these are two F1 instances that are running. And also conveniently, I have these two shells um, on the, so I'm sorry if this is not that visible, but I just want to go through this real quick. Sorry, um, the network connection broke. I'll just.
Okay, so I started that one early, um, but basically it's your normal Spark submit command. The only difference is you see these two flags, the acceleration flags. On this side, it's set to true. On the blue side, on the left side, it was set to false. So normal Spark will be running on the left side on the CPU, and FPGA accelerated Spark is running on the right side. So we gave uh, normal Spark a head start. So what's happening here behind the scenes uh, is that um, what we have is accelerator, operator accelerator templates for the FPGA, right? And so when the physical plan is produced by Spark, we're able to do a pattern match of those accelerator templates, a library of accelerator templates, a pattern match to the particular physical plan, and then configure it for the user application, all automatically, all, all uh, pre-compiled, and all, uh, all configured for you automatically at runtime. So it's a, it's a normal process of generating Spark code at runtime. It's just uh, um, it, it go, goes to the FPGA in this case. So you can see the FPGA is uh, <coughs> running much, much faster. Um, this particular query is actually uh, ingest heavy, but it's exactly the same code running on the two, um, on the two, on the two nodes. Um, and you can see right there, uh, that's where the code, code generation is happening. So it takes maybe a, uh, maybe a second longer than normal code generation in Spark, but uh, the performance benefits are pretty uh, extreme. So are there any questions about how this works? Um, well, yeah, please. Okay, so we do accelerate ingest as well as compute. Uh, it's, it's all Spark SQL. Um, so we have an accelerated join, filter, aggregate. Um, all, all those are available on the FPGA, or will be. So, that's, uh, so we can accelerate stage by stage. So it is possible to just accelerate ingest only but we're, our product is gonna accelerate all of those operators. They should, they should, yeah. And the other, the other thing is that, um, the, I mentioned the slicing and dicing of the computation. So there's certain operations, and the more technical people would know more about this, the hardware people. Um, that are actually better run on the CPU than on the FPGA. You don't, you don't want to, like I think a large join because of memory limitations, you don't want to run that on the FPGA, right? You want to accelerate it. But we have software-based acceleration in native C++ for the CPU and also FPGA-based acceleration with these accelerator templates. So those two work together to, to, to provide end-to-end -end acceleration. Um, so, yeah, we, we've seen, you know, uh, solutions that just accelerate ingest or just accelerate I.O. Or, or just networking. So this is trying to be an end-to-end -end solution. So this, is, this demo is actually uh, purposely annoying because we want to wait for um, Spark to finish here. Um, so we just want to calculate. So this is the end-to-end -end time, and you'll see the, the answers are the same. Um, let's just do one over X. I'm sorry, just one second. So we're getting around 4.2 uh, X speed up on this particular query um, related to the previous run. Yes, sir. I, I believe it's an offline mode. Um, do you want to talk about that, Bala? Okay. You should talk to him about all your FPGA questions. Okay, so that's the demo. Um, again, uh, the key things there were is the you know no code change, exact same code running on both, and then the ease of ease of uh, allocation of, of the nodes. So uh, just to summarize, um, what are you know the advantages and paradigms that we think about acceleration? So acceleration has the opportunity to alleviate both compute and networking, you know, mo moving data from I.O. or over the network uh, by accelerated connectors. And we really want to look, you know, Amdahl's law is out to get us. So we really want to look at uh, an end-to-end -end solution like that. Um, it's generally lower cost. I'm going to make that claim. It's generally lower cost than scaling, so buying more computers. Um, so, uh, and the key thing is you get 
TCO savings, for example, on the cloud, your cluster is cheaper, and you get fa and and you can get uh, faster turnaround time. So there is a double benefit there. So um, just some friendly advice, totally unbiased, uh, when you're you know grocery shopping for acceleration solutions, um, you want to you want uh, you want to make sure it minimizes application reengineering effort. That is a big showstopper. That's what we're finding in our POCs. Uh, you, you want a zero code change uh, paradigm if possible. Um, you want to evaluate the ease of deployment. People have talked about this, how easy it is to, de how easy is it to deploy uh, on your on-premise and on the cloud. Make sure that uh, you evaluate that. You want to ensure that performance is end-to-end. -end. So as the gentleman asked, you know, we want to speed up ingest, shuffle, uh, compute. So all of those need to, need to be sped up because we're going to be limited by what we don't accelerate, basically. Um, and you want to leverage the advanced hardware automatically. So we don't want to, there is a solution out there that uh, their claim is, you know, 10% of data scientists will learn how to program FPGAs. We, we disagree with that sentiment. Um, so we, we want a solution that pro programs the hardware automatically. And um, you, you, if possible, you want to make it platform independent because platforms, and, that, and by that I mean hardware platform as well as a big data platform. So. Uh, because they tend, to mar they tend to marry you into a particular uh, programming model. And so uh, it's better if it's independent of that. That's my talk. Uh, I'll take any more questions. Or... Thank you. Is there any questions at this point? Um, two questions for you. Mm -hmm. When you say platform independent, uh, you mean uh, Mapper, Hortonworks, or Cloudera, or? I didn't say those names, uh, but uh, that's the kind of thing, yeah. So that, that and also the hardware. So we don't, you don't want to marry your acceleration solution to any particular uh, buy of hardware, because that can, that can be a moving target. Okay, let's say we, we're talking about on-prem uh, environment, and uh, do we have to do any hardware changes for your acceleration, or uh, because we are CPU, GPU kind of thing, so will that work? Through well, so CPU works out of the box with the software acceleration, right? It's just a, uh, it's a C++ compiler. Um, GPU is roadmapped currently, so we don't c currently support GPU. But that's, that's down the road. We're starting with uh, CPU-based and FPGA-based acceleration. But the answer to your question is no, you don't have to change your, your, hard, your hardware at all. Uh, Dan, um, you said Spark is in your pipeline, or it, it's already out? In, Spark as a part? is, yes. It's, it's fully end-to-end -end with the MLlib MLlib support and Sorry, everything, what? right? End-to-end, uh, -end, MLlib support too? Uh, yes. Uh, in, in software, it is. Okay. Um, for FPGA, you know, talk to us. Uh, we're, we're, as our uh, product grows, we're getting more and more operations on, onto the FPGA. All right. In your pipeline, uh, what's next after Spark? Uh, um, any Hadoop, Hadoop technologies? Wherever our customers take us. So we tend to have our customers uh, do our roadmap. Um, there's other considerations where some of those DAGs are more similar or, or SQL-based. Um, you know, for example, our most recent engagement, our customer needed Hive scan support, so we added that. That's typically how we grow. So, I mean, if you want to talk to us about what our current roadmap is, I'd be happy to uh, direct you. All right, thanks. Thank you. Any other questions? You mentioned software acceleration, and I was just, um, you're saying that because it's compiled down, it's actually faster than Java or whatever on top of it. Correct. But you're seeing enough performance to make it worthwhile. I can, can you? You're seeing enough performance change to make it worthwhile to do that? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, so like I said, it's about two to four X acceleration. Actually, Weiwei can talk about some of the specific optimizations. Um, she's the compiler expert. But I think it's uh, like vectorization, uh, compile time typing, those kind of things pr provide performance over Java. Also, the lack of gar the, the garbage collection is, is alleviated without the J Java virtual machine. So. Any other questions? All right. Well, let's thank group one more time. Thanks very much. Thank you.